is going on, guys? Thank you so very much for joining me right here on Off The Script. This is episode 301, part number two for your Saturday, your War Games Saturday, November 23rd, 2019, and what a show we have for you today. So much going on this weekend. The WWE is in Chicago we had SmackDown last night, we got War Games tonight, we got Survivor Series on Sunday, we got Monday Night Raw on Monday, which is never good, but I got a lot of news on this Saturday, man. Of course, our favorite clown, our favorite clown, Seth Rollins, man, he's really gearing up for WrestleMania season already. Not only did he embarrass himself this year on social media, not only did he not listen to CM Punk's words of wisdom on Tuesday with WWE backstage and CM Punk literally and subtly and calmly and professionally burying Seth Rollins. Seth Rollins is now formally calling out CM Punk for a match at WrestleMania 36. Why? Why are you so desperate, Mr. Becky Lynch? I don't get it. If Punk has one WrestleMania match, it's not against Seth Rollins. I got two people ahead of him. Actually, he's not even on my list. I got two people ahead of Seth Rollins that I want to see in the ring with CM Punk. I don't even want to see Seth Rollins on fucking TV, never mind in a match at WrestleMania in the main event against CM Punk. Yes, let's bring CM Punk to put him, let's bring back CM Punk to put him in the ring with the most dead act on WWE television. Sounds like a really, really great idea and a winning recipe for WWE, said no one ever. Also, Seth Rollins' best friend, Roman Reigns, if you think that's bad enough at WrestleMania. Folks, Bray Wyatt is about to get buried. Been saying it. I've been hinting at it. It's coming. The Fiend will be destroyed at WrestleMania. And it will come at the hands of the Roman Empire. I can't help but smile. I love when I'm right. I love when I am right. And then, on top of that, WWE is going to have Bray Wyatt remain undefeated as he goes into WrestleMania and defends not only his undefeated streak and the Universal Championship, but it'll be against Roman Reigns. What's the news on this? How did this come to be? We'll talk about it on the podcast. Randy Orton, he reveals why he teased going to AEW. Steve Austin criticizes tag team wrestling in WWE. Finally, after all these many months, we got tag team wrestling on NXT, and it was simply mesmerizing with the Revival and the Undisputed Era. A bunch of talent. I got some talent that's staying. I got some talent that won out badly from WWE. Who are they? We'll talk about it right here on the podcast. And I got all your Survivor Series news, rumors, and major spoilers right here on Off The Script. Thank you guys so very much for joining me right here on the podcast. 301 episodes, and we're celebrating it. The best way that we can, man. Survivor Series Weekend. Thank you guys so very much for joining me here on the show. If you missed part one on Friday, make sure you guys go and check that out. We talk about CM Punk and his debut as an analyst on WWE Backstage. What he said about the product. How he buried Seth Rollins. How he buried WWE. And why WWE higher-ups were very disappointed with the rating that Backstage got with CM Punk's debut. Obviously, we go over that, and I go over exactly how crazy they are because they are short-sighted individuals that aren't looking at the bigger picture. We also go over the Jim Cornette situation and my thoughts on him quitting NWA. So make sure you guys go and check all of that stuff out from Friday. On top of that, Raw... We got Off The Script Elite on Tuesday, AEW Dynamite Review on Wednesday, NXT Review on Thursday, SmackDown Review on Friday, along with Off The Script 301 Part 1 
Lots of content for you guys. Go check it out. Links will be down in the description of this very video. Follow me on social media. It is imperative that you guys do so because I'll be live tweeting during war games and during the Survivor Series. If you guys want my in real time thoughts on everything happening on this major pay-per-view weekend in Chicago, then follow me on Twitter at JD from NY206. Follow me on Instagram as well. Same at at JD from NY206. Hit that subscribe button down below and turn on that bell for all notifications. If you guys want to support the podcast via Patreon, you guys can certainly do so as well. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. And today's podcast is brought to you guys by my good friends over at The Ridge. Ridge Ridge.com slash script. You guys are going to use code script at checkout to save yourself 10% off this holiday season. So what exactly is The Ridge? As you guys can see in this beautiful layout that Salrex made me, The Ridge is actually a very slim, sleek, and attractive wallet that keeps you safe And it makes sure that you can carry everything that you need in the most simplest of ways. I got the Ridge wallet, as you guys can see here. This is a very beautiful wallet. I love it. I take it with me everywhere I go. I never leave the house without it. Now, the Ridge wants to make you guys as easy as possible to carry everything you need every single day. From streamlining how you carry cash and cards in their flagship Ridge wallet to their portable commuter charging backpack. They want to make the most out of what you bring with you every single day. I've been using this Ridge wallet for about a year now. I love everything about it. I love how much it is an improvement over my old leather, beat down, worn out wallet. I used to go shopping for wallets at Hot Topic and Spencer's. I used to buy trendy Nintendo-like wallets with Zelda and Mario on them. They used to rip in about six weeks. I love the fact that my wallet, my Ridge wallet, does not rip. I love that it doesn't bend. I love that it doesn't fold. I love that it always looks clean and stylish. And I know that when I pull my wallet out, when I'm at the bar, I got the nicest wallet in the joint. I also love the RFID blocking quality, so I know that my ID and my card information is completely safe. The Ridge is also confident that you'll enjoy their product, that they've made it as simple as possible. Free shipping, so you guys can get it fast. Free returns, in case you don't like it. And if you do like it, there's a lifetime guarantee. There's also 30,000 five-star reviews. Yes, you heard me correctly. 30,000 five-star reviews, so they have a lot to be confident about. The Ridge is super durable, made from military-grade materials like titanium and carbon fiber. I have the titanium. I absolutely love it. It's bulletproof, waterproof, and John Moxley-proof. It is chainsaw-proof as well. Guys, The Ridge have been sponsoring the podcast for the majority of 2019. I want you guys to go to ridge.com slash script. Choose the wallet that you want, whether it's for yourself, your dad, your grandpa, your best friend. You guys are going to enter code SCRIPT at checkout to save 10% off this holiday season. Not just the wallet, literally everything on their website. As always, you guys can use code SCRIPT for every single purchase you make this holiday season. Get 10% off and enjoy the holidays with The Ridge. Man, oh man, this guy never learns. This guy is an absolute clown. He just never learns, never learns. This is why we call him Seth Clownlins. I don't understand, man. I really don't understand why this guy is so social media just oblivious. I really don't. The guy is now challenging CM Punk to a match at WrestleMania 36. You knew it was coming. You knew the formal invitation was coming. After all the social media banter that he did, Punk was on WWE backstage. He gave Seth Rollins some friendly and respectful advice. Stay off of social media. Stay off of social media. Of course, Seth Rollins did not listen to CM Punk's words of wisdom and at 2 o'clock in the morning was tweeting, I wonder where Becky Lynch was at 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't know. I figured at this time, Becky Lynch would have his phone locked up. Locked up. Far, far away from the grasp of the clown. Now, I don't know. I don't know how he got his cell phone. You figured at some point in the last week that Rollins and Becky would have had a nice little sit-down over a cup of 
caramel macchiatos, right? A couple of cups of caramel macchiatos on the table. They're going back and forth on how to handle yourself on social media. Now, Becky rolls on into Full Sail. She gets cheered. She's beloved, right? And then Rollins shows up at the end of the show, and he gets booed out of the building. People are chanting, Rollins is not cool. He's not wanted in Full Sail. That had to sting, bro. That had to sting. I know it would do me, being that I was the first NXT champion. So he shows back up. Nobody wants him there. Nobody likes him. Guy's career is dead in the water. As cold as Iceman is Seth Rollins. So you figured Becky Lynch was going over some social media etiquette with Seth Rollins. You'd think he would listen to his fiance. Of course not. Of course not. This guy hasn't learned a goddamn thing from Becky, from Punk, from WWE, from anyone. He continues to run his mouth. And he did the same thing on a media blitz in Chicago. Now, he sat down with Russell Zone's Kevin Kalam on 101 WKQX in Chicago. I haven't paid attention to anything Russell Zone related since the days of chair shot reality with Labar, Eisenberg, and Ghoulish. Shout out to my boy Brian Ghoulish. And I quote, He knows where I'm going to be this Sunday and Monday. I feel so bad that you have to be where you have to be on Monday, Seth, because we all know it's a steaming dumpster fire of bullshit. Maybe Saturday, maybe Friday, who knows? Who the fuck knows with WWE creative? They don't know where the fucking, you know, what, what the sky is. They don't know what color the sky is. They don't know their head from their ass. They don't know what fucking city they're in. They don't know what day of the week it is. Oh my fucking creative. Who knows? But he knows for sure where I'm going to be on Sunday and Monday. And I'm sure he doesn't want to be where you are on Sunday and Monday. Not when he's got AJ Lee sitting at home. Believe me. Maybe he's hiding out in LA, sitting behind his little desk. Like he's a fucking, uh, like he's some secretary. Sitting behind his desk, typing up what he's going to say on WWE Backstage. Yeah, I'm sure. Right? Maybe he's a little keyboard warrior-ish as well. Who knows? So, Rollins is, of course, mentioning the fact that he is in CM Punk's backyard in Chicago this weekend for Survivor Series. Any type of Punk presence at Survivor Series, I'm sure, will implode that building. The man wasn't done. Of course not. Pink condom man and uh, pineapple trunks with American floaties, American flag floaties, is not done. I don't know what he's up to, but the bottom line is, wherever, whenever he wants to do this thing, if he wants to man up and do it, I'm there. Are we having a coffee off somewhere? What are we doing? Are we having a battle of the lattes, Mr. Rollins, at 392? What are we doing? What do you exactly want here with CM Punk? For me, the only place the match happens is at WrestleMania. I would rather watch them barista off at WrestleMania than actually wrestle. I mean this wholeheartedly. I would rather watch who can make a better caramel macchiato. Because that foam is the most important part, man. If that caramel drizzle does not sit perfectly on that foam, you have done a bad job. Anyway, going back to my coffee days. I make one hell of a fucking caramel macchiato. I make one hell of a fucking cappuccino. Now... Obviously, he wants a match at WrestleMania. All joking aside, he wants a match at WrestleMania in the main event of all things. Of course, right? CM Punk didn't get his main event with Daniel Bryan. Now you want to be in the main event with CM Punk. It doesn't work that way, clown. The only reason I'm picking a fight with him, I've got no other interest than that. If he's interested, it's out there. Anytime you're ready, let's go. So Punk was on WWE Backstage this Tuesday. He had some... Very admirable advice for Mr. Rollins. And they went back and forth on social media. Or he actually took it upon himself to tweet CM Punk. CM Punk didn't give two shits that this guy was tweeting him. I want my journalistic integrity to be intact. So this isn't the show where you come on and shoot your little angles, said CM Punk on WWE Backstage. Seth needs to stop tweeting and realize sometimes it's better to be viewed as the fool and shut your mouth than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Rollins also responded directly to Punk's comments in this interview with WrestleZone, and I quote, 
Say whatever you want, play it however you want. That's what Punk always does, Rollins said. But at the end of the day, if he wants to come on a show and run his mouth about me and a company that I've been a part of for the last five years. <laughs> Here we go again. Oh, my God. You know, and a company that I've been a part of and he has no part of in the last five years. Then, of course, I'm going to stand up for it. This is a place that has given me everything that I've ever wanted in my life. Not only for me, but it has provided me a living for my family, for people that I love and care about. And of course, I'm going to have its back. <laughs> I'm not going to sit here and let you push it around Push me around and act like you're so cool. You couldn't burst a ch or you couldn't bust a cherry in a fruit fight, dude. And then you want to know why he should stay off any fucking social media and stay away from any microphone. What the fuck is that? You couldn't bust a cherry in a fruit fight, dude. Who the fuck talks like that? Seriously, Renee Young was 100% correct in her analysis of this clown. He lost his edge. He's lost his edge. Then he's not done. He's not done. Of course he's not. I want to make some money. So if CM Punk wants to talk all of the smack in the world, I've invited him a million times to come to my ring, to my domain, on live television where you can't hide behind anything. No desk in L.A., when when did CM Punk ever say he's gotten a desk in LA? Let's do this thing, man. Let's fight. Let's fight it out like men. End quote. This is the most desperate plea for attention. The most desperate plea for relevance. I have ever seen somebody on the active roster go out there and do. Roman Reigns, and he was pretty fucking bad, has never lowered himself to do something like this in the eye of the general public and the media. This is fucking pathetic. It is sad. It really is. I am not interested in Rollins versus Punk. I am not interested in Rollins, period. I want Rollins to go away. Rollins' career is as dead, dead as dishwater. The guy is fucking dead. He's ice cold. He's got no charisma. He can't even fucking captivate you via a promo. A simple wrestling promo. Nobody wants to see him. His in-ring ability has fallen off big time. It's the same fucking match every single time. Now you want Punk in the main event of WrestleMania. Let me tell you something. Punk, if he comes back for this, I have zero interest in this match whatsoever. The only matches I want to see out of CM Punk right now, and there is nobody on the active roster that I'm really interested in jumping out of my chair for, for a CM Punk match. I'm not. I'm really not. There's two. One of them would be Daniel Bryan. The main event that we never got at WrestleMania 30, I would be interested in that. I would love to see those two in the ring. Even though I'm sure it wouldn't mean as much as it would have then, I would still love to see it. My number one match with CM Punk back on WWE television is with Paul Levesque. That's my number one match for CM Punk against Triple H. Do you want to know why? Because there was real life animosity there. There was real life hatred there. Punk had some very nasty things to say about Triple H on the podcast with Colt Cabana. The greatest wrestling podcast that ever existed. Right? He went on there and blasted the entire company. Triple H was a part of his venom. And I would love to see that all these years later because if you put Triple H in a ring with a live microphone across the ring from CM Punk with a live microphone in his hand, that is television fucking gold. Gold. You let those guys go out there free reign and say whatever they have to say, then it's going to be amazing television. And you know Triple H is always up for something. You know Triple H could fucking cut you down left and right with what he's going to say. And you know Punk is going to be the only one to bring it right to Triple H. We're going to be on the edge of our seats with both of those men on television with microphones in their hand after seven years. Letting all that frustration out in a worked angle. 
to just play off of reality. That's exactly what I want. The fuck is he going to do with Seth Rollins? Crybaby Rollins here. Oh my God. You're talking about a company that you haven't been a part of for five years. Who the fuck are you? This place is giving me everything. Boo hoo, cry me a fucking river. You fucking clown. You're not important to anybody anymore. You've lost everything that was ever fucking meaningful to you. As far as your wrestling career goes. You basically are Roman Reigns. You're Roman Reigns. Back when Roman Reigns was fucking shoved down everybody's throat. But you're coming off much worse than Roman Reigns. This is sad. He is so desperate for any type of relevance that he's going out there and clinging onto a fucking hopeful match with somebody that has honestly said he has no interest in coming back to the ring yet. So what are you trying to do here? What are you trying to do? A lot of people are thinking that the seeds are being planted and this is the WrestleMania match. I hope to God not. I really hope to God not. I mentioned this on yesterday's show. I don't want Punk in the ring until he's ready. When he's ready, when he's ready to come back, when he feels like he can be the best in the world, and with an opponent and a storyline of his choosing when he wants to do it and how he wants to do it. I don't think CM Punk is going to pick Seth Rollins, of all people on that roster, to work a match with. Yes, Seth Rollins. He is, or was, one of the best things on WWE television. Why would Punk come back, of all places, to the WWE and have your pick of the litter in WWE to work a match with? Why would it be Seth Rollins, knowing what you know about him and his current status on WWE television? Daniel Bryan or Triple H is the match. Triple H probably number one, followed by Daniel Bryan number two. Nobody wants to be in the ring with that clown. Nobody even wants to see that clown on television. This is the face of the company who just goes out there and cries about me, 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 me. What about me? You're coming into my company. A company that's given me everything. You want to say shit about my company? Fight me. No, CM Punk is very well aware of why you want to fight him. Because he knows your career is fucking ice cold and going nowhere. Will Punk allow him to make a name off of Punk's career? I don't know. I don't know. But Seth Rollins certainly knows what he's doing. Believe me, Rollins needs Punk. Punk doesn't need any part of anybody in the WWE, especially Seth Rollins. From one loser and a clown to another loser and a clown. Roman Reigns, everybody's favorite wrestler on the WWE roster. Roman Reigns. Now, I don't want to sit here and bullshit you guys. I never do. I've said it once. I've said it a few times this year. Roman Reigns has been tolerable for the majority of 2019. WWE hasn't forced his agenda in plain sight down our throats. It's been subtle. It's still there. You see what they are doing with Roman Reigns. Everything that they've done with Roman Reigns has clearly been by design. Let's yank the chain back several notches and then maybe people will start liking him. Let's push Seth Rollins as the new Roman Reigns and get fans to hate him so that maybe all of that hatred turns into cheers for Roman Reigns. Don't you think they're using Seth Rollins as a mere puppet? Don't you think that they're using Seth Rollins as a mere toy in this Roman agenda? I think so. I think so. Everything that's happening to Rollins was happening to Reigns. Now, just think of it in the reverse way. Now, Reigns was in Rollins' position last time. Now, when Reigns was the hated one, we all love Seth Rollins, right? Oh, Rollins is the guy in the shield that we want. Rollins is the guy in the shield that should beat Brock Lesnar. He should be the face of the WWE. Rollins is the better wrestler, right? We all wanted Rollins. We all vehemently hated Roman Reigns. Now look at it this year. Don't you think it's been done by design, people? Don't you think it's been done by design? Now, Seth Rollins is the most hated man to come out of the Shield. And he's the most hated man in all of WWE right now. He's the most disliked member of that roster. Up and down. There's not one person 
that is more hated than Seth Rollins. Now, Roman Reigns is on the opposite end of all that negativity. He's the one who actually doesn't look that bad. Again, I ask you, don't you think it's kind of bizarre that it ended up being this way? Don't you think it's been done by design? Don't you think that this was in WWE's plan all along? They have the power of the pen. They give you the narrative that they want. You didn't think of it that way, did you? Well, I just fucking made your head explode. And now when you watch TV and you watch Rollins and you watch Reigns and you watch what happens going into WrestleMania season, you're going to think right back to this explanation on OTS. Oh, where did I hear that? JD said it. Where did I hear this before? Why is it right? JD said it. I know what I am talking about. It is, it, it's in plain sight. It is right in front of your face. And they don't hide it. They don't hide it. They don't plan to hide it. Now, with Roman Reigns, with Roman Reigns in this nest, in this safe space in WWE, for now, for now, Roman Reigns being moved to SmackDown on Fox, we all knew that eventually he was going to be in the main event again. They are not going to keep him in the mid-card feuding with Baron Corbin for the foreseeable future. This is nothing more than an... It's an uneventful fucking situation that is just biding time before WWE decides and snaps their fingers. Yep, we're going to move him on into the Royal Rumble. He's going to win the Royal Rumble. And then he's going to challenge for the Universal Championship. Now, we all thought it was going to be Brock Lesnar because Brock Lesnar was drafted by Fox for obvious reasons. Then WWE switched Lesnar to Raw, took Bray Wyatt from Raw, put him on SmackDown, changed the red title to the blue title, changed the fruit roll-up title to the fucking Smurf title, the blueberry title, however you want to go about calling it. Roman Reigns is still the number one babyface on that show, if you want to go in that route, because what they're doing with Daniel Bryan, that might actually supersede Roman Reigns. But Roman Reigns is the number one man on that show. And with that comes a WrestleMania main event, of course. It was going to be Reigns and Lesnar. So substitute Brock Lesnar for whoever the champion is now. And ladies and gentlemen, you have your WrestleMania Universal Championship match. And I don't think that bodes well for anybody watching. Roman Reigns is set for a huge WrestleMania push in 2020. The planned main event is for Roman Reigns to challenge Bray Wyatt, the Fiend, for the Universal Championship. Now, there is reports going around on Sports Kita, on Wrestling News, on PW Insider, that Roman Reigns and the idea backstage is that it has been long enough that the fans will forget how hard Reigns was pushed before. Oh, how foolish you are. I didn't forget. Did you forget? Soon as Reigns starts to get pushed, the nightmares will once again fucking formulate in everybody's mind. They will once again come back and haunt us for WrestleMania season. As soon as you start pushing Roman Reigns in that way again, it is all going down the fucking toilet. Every little bit of positivity I threw at Roman Reigns, as far as his character on WWE TV, will wash down the fucking toilet. Goodbye. It's going to go flush. Goodbye. Gone forever. I don't know how they think fans are going to forget about this. I don't know how they operate. How stupid do you think the people are watching this show? Now, the majority of the audience are blithering idiots. I am not. I am not. I don't know how you think, with all that you did with Reigns, or the little that you did with Reigns in the main event, is going to just transfer itself into the main event so that you could push him again the way that you want. It's not going to work that way. They did not prove successful over time and fans started to resent Reigns for the push that he, that he was receiving. If Reigns, no matter how positive the reaction is, and it's still not 
completely there. He's not getting overwhelming reactions. There's still booze when Roman Reigns comes out. I don't know why you think that if this guy was not the guy that the fans wanted then, why the fans are going to want him now. And then you're planning on feuding him with The Fiend, who single-handedly had Rollins turn into a fucking heel. You think the same thing isn't going to happen with Roman Reigns? You must be fucking stupid. Now, Reigns, obviously, Vince McMahon still sees Roman Reigns as a top superstar, and this could put him in line for a big push around WrestleMania. Now, this source says, and I quote, the feeling on Reigns is that he's gone long enough without being shoved in the fan's face, that he's no longer seeing the fan backlash that Seth Rollins is getting right now, or the backlash that John Cena was getting for most of his babyface run. End quote. There's that name. Seth Rollins. He isn't getting the amount of heat that Seth Rollins is getting right now. Which goes back to what I just previous, previously stated. Don't you think that this was done by design? WWE has the power to make or break anybody. They are breaking Seth Rollins. Because he was the one the fans wanted. Now, you look at Rollins and everybody fucking hates him. Who's the other biggest face in the company in the eyes of WWE? Roman Reigns. They think if you hate Rollins enough that you are going to side with Roman Reigns. Because it worked the opposite way. We hated Roman Reigns and we all wanted Rollins. Now we all hate Rollins and now they think that we're going to want Roman Reigns. No, sir. No, sir. It's not going to work that way. I see right through you. It's also being reported that Reigns' current feud with Baron Corbin is considered a placeholder as they go into the new year. If the Reigns is done with Corbin, then he could very well be on an eventful road to WrestleMania. Now, Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt is the man. I stated it in a joking fashion. Just wait till Bray Wyatt wins the Universal Championship. Oh, he got moved to SmackDown. You know what that means, folks. It took about 27 curb stomps to fucking not beat Bray Wyatt. What is it gonna take? WWE creatively. How are they gonna write creatively to beat Bray Wyatt? When you see that one spear take down the Fiend in the red lighting at WrestleMania, that is all it's going to take. I joked about it, but hidden in that joke was 100% truth. Don't you think that is the outcome that they're planning right now? One spear to the Fiend, and that's it. Roman Reigns is right back to where he was. Everybody hates him, and the Fiend is dead. The Fiend will die at WrestleMania. Bray Wyatt's undefeated streak is going to take him from here all the way till WrestleMania. He's yet to lose a match on WWE TV. And however you want to go about it, Bray Wyatt has said that The Fiend cannot be defeated in the red light. There's a reason for the red light. WWE wants to just pretty much put Bray Wyatt in a situation where the fans look at him and his character and think that he is unstoppable. There's a reason for The Fiend right now being pushed so heavily in this way. WWE sees money in The Fiend. Now, I don't know. I mentioned this on the SmackDown review. I, I really am starting to fall off as far as my interest in The Fiend. I really am. And it's not because I'm a fickle fan. It's not because I... I'm a turncoat, or I'm picky, or you do this all the time, you love somebody so much, and then it's just in typical fashion that everybody starts to hate them. Don't you think it has something to do with the, with, with the way that they're portrayed on television? Don't you think that's the reason? Why would it be the reason? Think back. Think back to when Tommaso Ciampa was the NXT champion. Did anybody... Did anybody ever say anything bad about Tommaso Ciampa? No. Because he was booked like a fucking beast. 
The guy was unstoppable. The guy was a legit heel. Everything he did, you fucking loved it. And he kept you coming back for more. There were people who wanted him to beat Johnny Gargano. Literally. And Johnny was the one chasing his fairy tale ending. Now you look at Bray Wyatt. And you look at the two situations. You compare Champa and Bray Wyatt. Why did we all love Champa for the 200 days that he was the NXT champion? Why are we all turning on Bray Wyatt right now? Because creatively, Champa was booked like a fucking legit champion. Bray Wyatt was ruined at Hell in a Cell. WWE did not capitalize on the Hell in a Cell. Now, if the outcome was different and Bray Wyatt won the Universal Championship the way that he should have inside Hell in a Cell, then I don't think we would be in this situation. The fact that we had to wait till Crown Jewel and have it be done in Saudi Arabia, pretty much in a shit fucking Falls Count Anywhere match, when we all know that the one moment they had to do it was the right moment, and they didn't, people gave up on it. People gave up on it. You turned people away so badly at that one outcome inside Hell in a Cell that when he won the championship, the majority of the audience was happy, but they didn't know how to show it. They didn't really know how to show their true feelings. Yeah, they were happy, but they were happy that the title was off of Seth Rollins. Not that it was on The Fiend. You could have put the title on fucking Kurt Hawkins. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You could have put the title on fucking the Brooklyn Brawler. It doesn't matter what, what the champion looked like at that point. It doesn't matter who you put it on. And then I was the one who was criticized. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you're negative. Why are you so negative? You got what you wanted. Yeah, we got what we wanted with Rollins not being the champion. The fucked up thing is, nobody understands. Nobody listens. Now, when The Fiend won the championship, that's all that mattered. Rollins is not the champion. It's not about the fucking Fiend. It's about the fact that Rollins is not the champion because he sucked so badly. Creatively, he was a mess. The Fiend should have won the title inside Hell in a Cell because that was the one moment where everybody knew it was the right decision. And he didn't do it. And when you don't give the fans what they want, they don't give a shit anymore. No matter how many fucking people try to brainwash you with their reviews and their fucking articles. Oh, the WWE rectified a mistake that they did at Hell in a Cell. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. That will live in infamy forever as long as you look at The Fiend. I'm right. There's no way around it. Absolutely no way around it. One source who was close to the creative process said that Wyatt will be in the main event of WrestleMania. So expect to see his push continue as they are working on ways to keep him strong. Looking on ways or creatively booking him in ways that he looks strong. Does that mean repetitive segments on SmackDown? Because what I've seen with Daniel Bryan is nothing more than the same shit we've seen with every legend that he was in the ring with. Every situation with Rollins in the build towards both of their matches. And now we're seeing the same thing with Daniel Bryan. How long before you all get seriously bored of The Fiend? Maybe that's what they want. Maybe this is their way to book Bray Wyatt so that he comes off in this manner to everybody so that when they book him against Roman Reigns, everybody wants to see The Fiend lose the championship because they're so fucking tired and bored of the act because no creativity went into it. Could be. Could be. Or this could end up like fucking Brock Lesnar all over again. Where Roman Reigns challenges the champion. He challenged Brock Lesnar and everybody wanted Reigns to lose. Everybody wanted Reigns to lose. Or it could end up not even that. Seth Rollins. This is going to be a Seth Rollins situation all over again. You might think that Roman Reigns is a baby face. And I use that term 
very loosely right now. You might think he's a babyface, but if Bray Wyatt is still that much more beloved over everybody else because of the Fiend character, and you put Roman Reigns against the Fiend at WrestleMania, that is the most smarkiest of crowds all year. You honestly think that people are going to side with Roman Reigns over The Fiend at WrestleMania? You have to be out of your fucking mind. WWE, in this fantasy land, thinks that Roman Reigns challenging Bray Wyatt is going to end up being, Oh, look at this! Bray Wyatt is a heel. Bray Wyatt is a heel. He's going to challenge the babyface, and Roman Reigns is going to conquer the beast at WrestleMania, right, he's going to conquer The the Fiend at WrestleMania, and then he's going to win, and everybody's going to throw a parade and be happy. It's not the way it's going to end up. You're living in a fucking fantasy world. Nobody is going to want to see The Fiend be beat by Roman Reigns. Nobody wanted to see The Fiend be beaten by Seth Rollins, and Seth Rollins was the man that we wanted all year. Then he was the man that we didn't want all year. It's going to be the same thing with Roman Reigns. You're not going to do it. You're not going to make it happen. You're not going to give Reigns the championship and then we're going to throw a fucking parade. This is our man. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's going to end up being Seth Rollins all over again. Every ounce of hatred that Reigns was receiving is going to be back. And then you're going to ask yourself, well, why are these fans so fickle? Because you can't manipulate us. We're not that fucking stupid. This will backfire. This will backfire. And then what happens when Bray Wyatt is defeated by a mere spear by Roman Reigns? The mystique, the aura, the power, the legend of The Fiend is dead. You're booking The Fiend right now as if it is a character that has a very small ceiling. You're not booking it in a way that is telling me the character has any sort of longevity. If that is your end goal for The Fiend, then I honestly sit here today and tell you that I would have rather not seen The Fiend on television, period. The fact that you're going to wash Bray Wyatt's creativity with this character that should be a mainstay for years in the WWE, you're going to give it all up for Roman Reigns? Meanwhile, you had Daniel Bryan, The Rock, Brock Lesnar on multiple occasions, Sheamus... Vince McMahon himself, the Shield, every single superstar on that roster that is currently employed, you threw in front of Roman Reigns to try and get him over, and nobody, zero, zero, zero results at the end of the day proved to be successful. Now you think The Fiend is going to work? Because The Fiend is the hottest act, barely, in WWE? You must be foolish. You must be fucking foolish. God. I I, I don't know how. This amount of stupidity is residing in this company. I really don't. Now, if you're asking me why I'm complaining about this, because this would be the seventh fucking time that they do the same thing and utter just... This sheer fucking cry, please, please, love Roman. And nobody wants to love Roman. Nobody sees Roman as the guy. He should not be the one in this situation. He was the guy that you failed to get over. He was the guy that the fans didn't want anything to do with. He's not the face of the company. Move the fuck on. What should have happened is Bray Wyatt stay on Raw... Stay on Raw. And then you build up the theme and put over a new act. I am not going to sit here and tell you that, you know, he's been booked in a meaningful way that he deserves a championship match, but this is WWE's fault. Bray Wyatt should have remained on Raw and you should have booked Bray Wyatt versus Aleister Black at WrestleMania, both men being undefeated, and Aleister Black beats the Fiend At WrestleMania. There is no fucking way you can tell me that there's not a great story hidden between both of those guys and you failing Aleister Black at this point. There's no way you could tell me that if Aleister Black was on TV and dominant and run through the entire roster and then he wins the Royal Rumble 
And then he goes on to beat The Fiend at WrestleMania. There's no way you could tell me that that wouldn't be something that got over with the audience. Someone new. It's someone that we all want to see fucking succeed. We all want to see him succeed because he's been held fucking down for 10 months. Fucking sitting in a closet somewhere. Everybody would have wanted to see it because it's something new and they're both undefeated. How is it going to look when the headline reads The Fiend versus O? Roman Reigns. There goes my WrestleMania trip. I don't even know why the fuck he would want to go out there at that point. Give me a break. Instead of booking and creatively writing to put someone new over that the fans actually want to see, you're going to go back and do the same shit that failed seven different fucking times. I don't know how much I can complain about. I'm sure this is just the tip of the iceberg. With this situation. But you all know, again, that I'm speaking logic. And I know most of you watching me with a fucking brain are going to say, you know what, he's right. You bet you, you better believe I'm right. Randy Orton. He's somebody that I would like to see against Aleister Black at WrestleMania. They're both on the same brand. Randy Orton. He was talked about. Or I believe he was on After the Bell with Corey Graves. Orton spoke to Corey Graves about the possibility of RKO dipping his toe, is what they described. In the waters outside WWE, the Viper replied that he was just having a good time with those AEW teases and that he never wanted to leave the WWE. Yeah, I was just having fun, he says. More so now than ever, I am aware of the other guys like Will Ospreay and other guys who worked with Cody and I'm watching more wrestling. I'm not in the WWE bubble as much as I have been for almost the last two decades. And I'm learning to appreciate other styles a little bit more instead of just quickly seeing something that isn't how I would do it or isn't how I would sell it. And I'm realizing in its own way that it is good. This might be upsetting to some people, but I never really saw myself leaving the WWE to me. It was about getting to the point where I'm happy and what I'm doing to my body and the amount of time that I've got with my family. And he goes on to say, in the end, it's all going to be worth it. And that's where I'm at right now. So I'm definitely happy to be a WWE superstar. We all know why Randy Orton did it. Hey, he's a master troll. He knows how to use social media correctly. And, you know, Tony Khan knew what he was doing because he said it in a reply on Twitter last week. You know, he used AEW, name-dropped AEW, and photographed himself trolling with all Elite Wrestling teases because he used them as leverage, you know? Now, I'm sure everybody in the WWE kind of knew he was going to go out there. And, you know, or the people in the WWE knew that he was going to stay. But there were people in the WWE who probably didn't know who were in charge of this type of thing, you know? And then they, they, they see Randy Orton on Instagram making all elite wrestling teases, and, you know, if you don't know what the fuck is going on, and you wake up one morning, and you start seeing that, whoa, what is this, we gotta get Randy in the office, we gotta sign him to a five-year deal, we gotta throw him about five million dollars, he's gonna stay, you know, so, clearly, he was doing it with WWE intentions, and he was also doing it with Randy Orton intentions, because he was already making upwards towards three, three and a half million dollars a year in WWE, and now he's got a nice little handsome raise coming to him. And don't think for a second that those teases did not help his cause in some way, shape, or form. Randy Orton was never going to leave the WWE. Never. He's probably got a lighter schedule. He's got more time with his family. He is a cornerstone of that company. A fucking Hall of Famer walking amongst us right now that's still in the prime of his career. You know? Randy Orton's not the most entertaining guy on the roster. I prefer a heel Randy Orton to the Randy Orton that we're seeing right now. The in-betweener. You know? Give me the Randy Orton that went out there and fucking stuck a screwdriver in Jeff Hardy's ear. That's what I want to see. That's the Randy Orton I want to see. I think that's the Randy Orton we need on Monday Night Raw because we need some sort of fucking adrenaline or excitement on that show. But Randy Orton was never leaving the WWE and he's never going to leave the WWE. But I do. I do appreciate Randy Orton not being in that WWE bubble where it's nothing but WWE and Everything that exists outside of WWE is fucking shit, you know? I appreciate that he knows who Will Ospreay is. I appreciate when he goes out there and say and says, I, I would love to wrestle Will Ospreay. I think we can have a hell of a match. 
I love the fact that he appreciates what Cody is doing. I love the fact that he looks at a guy like Sammy Guevara. You know, when Randy Orton mentions somebody like Sammy Guevara, that shit holds weight. Because he's never done that or said that about anybody, rarely. You know, and the fact that he's mentioning, I think Sammy Guevara is a, a major talent. He's got a bright future ahead of him. That holds significant weight when it comes out of the mouth of Randy Orton. And the fact that he appreciates what Cody is doing in All Elite Wrestling, you know, he might have used them for leverage, but I do believe that when Randy Orton says what he says about All Elite Wrestling, Will Ospreay and, and Sammy Guevara, I do think that he's opened up a little bit and isn't the guy that says flips and dives and fucking theatrics. Go fuck yourself, man. This is where it's at in the WWE. I'll show you how to wrestle a real wrestling match. I love the fact that he's open to what else is going on in the wrestling world. You have to be. You have to be. If you stay in that WWE bubble too long, it's not going to be good for your mental health, man. And, and you're going to come off looking like an idiot because nobody wants to listen to somebody that's ill-informed like somebody. And Vince McMahon is that way. His boss is that way. So I appreciate that Randy Orton is a little bit more knowledgeable on what's going on outside of the WWE bubble. Steve Austin. He criticizes tag team wrestling in the WWE, which I do on a weekly basis. Steve Austin on the Steve Austin Show opened up about the current state of tag team wrestling in the WWE, and he admitted that it's not what it used to be. A lot of the problems is that there aren't enough teams to really have a deep division and build the proper history and stories needed to really get over with the fans. He says this, and I quote, Man, and that's the thing. The tag team scene just ain't what it used to be, and that's not knocking any team out there. I'm just saying that there aren't as many teams and they're not together as long to build the history, the chemistry, and you just know what the other guy is going to do when you go out there. You have four different people out there and a referee. With all the minds and all the different tricks you can do, there's so much to watch, so I love tag team wrestling. It's just that it has kind of faded off a little bit, and that's with all respect to the tag team still out there doing good work. It's just changed. End quote. Nothing's changed. Vince McMahon has always hated tag team wrestling, and that goes to show you what he feels about tag team wrestling now, that the tag team championships and the division is in such a shit state. I don't agree that he says there aren't enough teams. There are plenty of teams in the WWE, to make a division, a solid division, on both shows. The fact is that WWE has so many teams, and they just refuse to book creatively those teams on TV. They want to give you the teams that you know, New Day. They want to give you, you if you think that they want to push the Viking Raiders, you're a fool. They don't want to push the Viking Raiders, but they have nobody else on that show to push. The AOP. You, you took AOP out of NXT, and that's what you do with them immediately when you bring them to the main roster. PP jokes with Drake Maverick. That's not a respect for tag team wrestling. They look like legit fucking killers in NXT, and when they come to Monday Night Raw, they look like a comedy act. They legitimately look like a comedy act that is fucking making PP jokes. You got the War Riders, you got AOP, you got Heavy Machinery, you got the New Day, you got the Usos waiting to come back, right? You got... So many teams. You got the club. Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins. What'd you do with them? You killed them off before they even got fucking going. They were dead before you even paired them together. So why the fuck am I going to care about those guys? You know, I loved Mojo and Zack Ryder. I thought they were a very good team. And they were about to get over. You kill the Bludgeon Brothers. Then you bring them back and pair them back together again. And then you break them up again. You got a solid fucking foundation of teams on this roster. That could easily create a division on both shows, but you don't care. You don't really care. They got the teams. What they don't have is the manpower to creatively write for those teams. So it, it all goes back to the creativity of the writing staff. They don't care. They really don't care. Why is tag team wrestling so cherished in NXT? Why The Revival's another one. You didn't really treat them good. You've only been giving them tag team title reigns just to coerce them into signing contracts and then you can fuck them over again. Why is tag team wrestling so looked at as special in NXT but when it's on the main roster, it's fucking something that is so unimportant? So why am I going to get excited about the Undisputed Era coming up to the main roster when I'm sure the Undisputed Era are going to be treated 
fucking like shit on the main roster. I don't get it. Every team, the Street Profits, another team on the main roster. You got these fucking teams on the main roster. Don't tell me that you don't have enough fucking teams. They got enough teams. Solid teams. It's about the writing. Write better. Give the tag team wrestlers out there time to shine. I don't want to see the War Raiders in fucking one-minute squash matches against fucking local guys that you picked up at the deli five miles away. Give me a break. Start booking them right. It's all it takes. A couple of months of that, we'll be good to go. And stop pushing the same fucking teams down our throats when you got teams ready to break out like Heavy Machinery and the Street Profits and the War Raiders and AOP. That's what we need to see. The more we see, the more consistently we see them, then they'll get over. Book them in a meaningful way. You got the teams and the manpower to make two divisions. Start today. Are they going to listen to me? Of course not. Guys, I got a bunch of news about re-signings and people want to leave the company, which I'm not surprised by. But before we get into that, got to shout out my good friends over at Harry's. Harry's.com slash script. You're going to get your holiday set this year, man. And if you don't, I don't know what you're doing. It makes the perfect gift this holiday season. What guy in your life are you guys shopping for this holiday season? Is it your dad? Is it your brother? Maybe your grandpa. Now, I know that I am not the biggest holiday guy. I am actually a real-life Grinch. But I remember back when we were little and we made the yearly Christmas trip over to my grandma's house and we presented my grandpa with his gifts for Christmas. They were lame gifts. And I even knew this as a young child. Socks t-shirts, underwear. I'm looking at this stuff as a child and I'm like, are you sure, Ma, that Grandpa's gonna like this stuff? This is pretty boring. If I was my Grandpa, I'd be like, what is this? Why? Why do I need more underwear? I love Harry's. I think Harry's is a great gift. I want you guys to change how you give gifts this holiday season. Harry's is a gift that is both thoughtful and practical. I love the fact that when I use a Harry's razor, I never cut myself. I love the smooth glide of the blade. I love the way that their foaming shave gel feels on my face. It leaves a beautiful tingling sensation all over my sensitive skin. So you guys are going to change the way you give gifts this year. And listeners of my show this year can get $5 off any Harry's shave set by heading to harrys.com slash script. You guys are actually going to get free shipping this year. And that ends. The free shipping ends on December 16th. So you better act now. It's a practical gift that he'll actually use. Harry's makes sharp blades that last. German engineered and award winning. Backed by a 100% quality guarantee. If he doesn't love his shave, you will get a full refund. It's a great deal for you and for him. Holiday sets just start at $20. That's within secret Santa limits. And Harry's blade refills are as low as $2 each, so your guy will save money over time. It comes ready to gift in a handsome holiday gift box, and your gift actually gives back 1% of each sale will be donated to charitable organizations. As a special offer for fans of the show, we've partnered with Harry's to give you $5 off any shave set, including their limited edition holiday sets, when you go to harrys.com slash script. Plus, remember, you're going to get the free shipping. Each Harry's shave set comes with a weighted handle with the option to engrave five blade razor cartridges, foaming shave gel for a rich lather, travel cover to protect your blades, packaged in a handsome holiday gift box. Guys, remember, free shipping ends on December 16th. Act now. Just go to harrys.com slash script and give the gift of Harry's this holiday season. You know, the backstage morale in WWE isn't... As high as everybody thinks it is with the big money contracts and all of the new feelings of moving to Fox. Everybody thinks it's the same old shit. A lot of unhappy people in the WWE, man, and understandably so. The creative sucks. It all boils down to WWE thinking that the wrestlers and the employees, well, we'll just give them more money. That's all that they want. We'll keep them happy by giving them more money. Ha 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 ha. Meanwhile... A lot of these men and women 
they feel stifled creatively. And all they want is to go out there and wrestle. They want to wrestle. They want to create a legacy. And now more than ever, it's one of those situations where WWE is thinking that money is going to be the one big determining factor. It may be to some. You know, it's not everybody that feels that way about wanting to go out there and take over the world crea- you know, creatively in, in a wrestling way. But there are people who want the money and there are people who want to go out there and create a legacy for themselves. And like I said, it, it's one of those situations where they have more options than ever before to make a, a very good living and also have the creative freedom to go out there and do what they want, where they can't get away with that in WWE and you're micromanaged every step of the way. Now, there are a bunch of names that I'm going to run through here quickly that have either re-signed or could, uh, or could be on their way out of the WWE. Nikki Cross re-signed with the WWE. Squared Circle Sirens is reporting this week that WWE reached a deal with the former WWE Women's Tag Team Champion Nikki Cross to remain with the promotion for the foreseeable future. Cross signed a three-year deal in WWE in 2016, so her contract was expected to be running up in a matter of months. There was no word on how long the WWE signed Cross for, so stay tuned to the podcast, and if I hear anything, I will let you guys know. Now, The Miz and Paige just signed new deals. The Miz just got done signing a five-year deal with the WWE. He re-signed for another new deal, which I'm assuming was going to be for more money and probably an extra year added on top of that. He'll be with the WWE through 2025. Paige decided to extend her stay with the WWE, and if she really wanted to go out there and wrestle... She could definitely do that and go the way of Daniel Bryan or the way that Daniel Bryan was going to go if WWE didn't allow him to wrestle under their banner. So Paige is probably pretty happy about what she's making with the WWE so much so that she decided to stay and just stay on her role or in her role with WWE backstage. So Nikki Cross resigns with the WWE. I know for a fact that Sasha did not sign a five-year deal that she refused a five-year deal, but they are paying her handsomely. So obviously with that and the extra perks and the fact that she is pretty much the face of the, uh, of the women's division in WWE or one of the faces of the women's division in WWE, the money was too difficult to turn down and she got that three-year deal where WWE is handing out five-year deals like candy. I don't want to sit here and tell you that Nikki Cross signed a five-year deal. I don't know how she feels about being in the WWE. Clearly, she's happy being in the WWE. Clearly, she's happy in her role creatively with the WWE that she even opted to sign with them again. So I'm assuming that it's at least for another three years. Upwards, it could be five years because WWE's been handing out five-year contracts for the simple fact that they want to keep everybody locked down without worrying about where they're going to go, mainly all elite wrestling. Who needs women's performers desperately. So Nikki Cross resigns with the WWE. Asuka. There was a rumor on Asuka leaving the WWE. And that only happened because Kyrie Sane is in the news about her possibly leaving the WWE when her contract is up in 2020, around January, February. Now, with Asuka, Dave Meltzer squashed this rumor. It was a rumor killer on the Wrestling Observer Radio. Dave Meltzer commented on Asuka's current WWE status. There are rumors that she could be leaving the WWE when her contract is up with Kyrie Sane, but Dave Meltzer said that she's actually quite happy in the WWE. I'm glad that she's happy because the fans are not happy about the way that the WWE has creatively booked her. So Dave says, and I quote, I've heard no rumblings whatsoever of Asuka leaving. I'm under the impression that she's very happy in this country. End quote. Asuka could have many more stories to tell in WWE, and it seems like she's down to just do what she's got to do. She's being featured on television. She's probably going to be in a major title match with Becky Lynch, possibly at the Royal Rumble. I don't know. You know, that would be great to see again. And it plays off the fact, finally, that Asuka tapped out Becky Lynch in the Royal Rumble of this year. It would be full circle to have the match happen again at this year's Royal Rumble for a women's championship. So that's pretty interesting in its own right, that back-to-back years we got Asuka and Becky Lynch 
in the Women's Championship match at the Royal Rumble. I kind of like that. Even though it's taken too long to go back and tell this story, I I do appreciate the fact that Asuka is being put in a situation where she could be given a spotlight to shine, even though she's probably not going to come out as the Women's Champion. But they have been giving the Kabuki Warriors a little bit more spotlight in that situation. Now, she's also got a YouTube channel that she's very happy about doing. She loves living in Orlando. She loves doing the YouTube channel. In fact, she's very popular on YouTube. She's almost got 100,000 subscribers. If if that already, she's got 100,000 subscribers. So she's doing pretty well for herself. And she's also found hobbies outside of the WWE to keep herself entertained. And from the looks of it, if you watch her on her YouTube channel, she enjoys being in the United States. So I hope Asuka don't leave. She's always been one of those women that I looked at that could be a face of the division. We all know why. WWE has failed to push her. They creatively suck. They don't know what to do with somebody like Asuka with the talents of Asuka. So, I guess all the bickering that we did, you know, it's a little bit less nowadays because she is getting some focus. And I guess that they have to because that division on Monday Night Raw is severely lacking outside of the big names that they got. They got nobody outside of the Kabuki Warriors, Becky, and Charlotte. And WWE really needs to get back on the grind and start building up some women so that they could be in the same conversation as those four on Monday Night Raw. If you don't do that, you are going to be you're going to be in a situation where it's just rinse and repeat and it's the same shit and it's not going to make the shows any better. It's not making the division any better and the fans are going to be unruly and unhappy at the end of the show because it's the same shit that we've seen every single week before that. So make sure you guys build a solid division. You got so many women in that company that you could have an unbelievable division that everybody is happy with. And like CM Punk said, stop pushing an agenda. Stop pushing this fucking agenda with these hashtags. Let the women go out there and do what they can do. You'll be surprised at the end of the night that they may be the most over thing on the show if you just let them be without any political fucking propaganda and agenda behind it. So Asuka, according to Dave Meltzer, she's not leaving. Anything can happen, but as of right now, I guess he's the only word that we have to go on. Kyrie saying she could be leaving the WWE at the end of her contract. Meltzer also talked about this in the same breath with Asuka on the Wrestling Observer Radio. Saiyan's contract is up early next year, in January, and unless she resigns, or already has, she could be one of the next names to exit WWE and has expressed interest in doing so. He says, and I quote, Kyrie saying, I could definitely see her leaving. I don't know if she's going to leave, but she's definitely expressed interest in exploring other options. Of course, as Melcher says, he doesn't know for sure that she's going to leave, but it's the final clause of that sentence that would suggest that it certainly is a possibility more so than Asuka. On top of that, Stardom has requested both Sane and Io Shirai back with them when their WWE contracts are set to expire. So I don't know if that has any bearing on where Kyrie Sane goes. I know All Elite Wrestling, if Kyrie Sane is going to be a free agent, you know for a fact that Cody Rhodes and everybody over there that does the signings are going to be looking at Kyrie saying she could be somebody that could bring that division some sense of relevancy. I think that would be a major signing for AEW. So don't think for a second that WWE is going to sit down if they have not already done so with Kyrie saying and try and sign her long term so that she doesn't go to AEW. WWE, I am sure, internally knows that AEW's women's division is lacking. Kyrie Sane is a difference maker for that division. That's all you need. You start plugging pieces in like Kyrie Sane, and then the pieces is, are, are going to start falling into place. Kyrie Sane could lead to Tessa Blanche, and Tessa Blanche could lead to Jordan Grace, you know, and whoever else is a free agent in WWE that sees a, a blooming division over there. They might want to go test the waters over there where they're not being given the opportunity in WWE. All it takes is one. WWE knows this. If Sane leaves... For AEW, it's a big deal. Now, we don't know where her mindset is. She wants to stay in the United States? We don't know. She wants to go back to Japan and compete in stardom? We don't know. Does she want that sense of competition? Does she want to just go out there and creatively be free? You know, and be back with her family? I don't know. We don't know anything about her family. We don't know where her family resides. If they're back in Japan, if they're here in the States with her. We don't know. So, it's going to be a wait-and-see situation. But Asuka, whereas Meltzer says Asuka 
is comfortable here. I, I do believe that. And if I was a betting man, I would say Kyrie Sane is more interested in leaving than she is in staying with the WWE. They haven't done anything with her creatively. And all it took was WWE pairing her with Asuka for WWE to push Kyrie Sane. They were never going to push Kyrie Sane as a single on the main roster, which is a fucking shame in its own right. Why even call her up at that point if you don't plan on using her? That is a shame. It's pathetic. Because she was great. She would have easily got over. There's no way that gimmick would have not got over with the audience. The little kids, the little girls would have loved that gimmick. And she's respectable in the ring if you just let her go. But the handcuffs, they're always shown. They're always showcased more so than letting the wrestlers go out there and show you what they're really made of. I'm thinking Kyrie saying leaves at the end of her contract. And then WWE is going to be asking, well, why? Well, why? Look yourselves in the mirror at that point. Now, there are... Other reports about Kyrie Sane, and on top of what Meltzer said, we got other reports coming in that there is no story to Kyrie Sane leaving the WWE or wanting out of the WWE. It is reported by other sources that she doesn't want to leave, contrary to what Dave Meltzer is reporting. According to sources, Kyrie Sane does not currently want to leave the company, contrary to what speculation Dave Meltzer is throwing out there. It's going to be a wait and see situation. Brian Kendrick. Brian Kendrick, he announces a leave of absence from the WWE. So if you guys are watching 205 Live, no more Brian Kendrick, at least for the foreseeable future. He went on Twitter to inform everybody that he will not be appearing in a WWE ring for quite some time. It's been three years since my last Cruiserweight title opportunity. Since then, it's become evident that nobody on 205 Live understands nor respects the road that I have paved for them. Therefore, I'm taking an indefinite leave of absence from the ring. And he added WWE. So that's that. Kendrick won the Cruiserweight title in 2016. Claims that after three years, WWE's Cruiserweight division has no no respect for anything that he's done in that division. Kendrick has not appeared regularly on 205 Live in recent months. I don't know. I haven't watched. And has yet to appear on NXT now that the Cruiserweights are defending the championship on Wednesday on NXT. No word on why Kendrick decided to step away. Maybe he is just burnt out from the road and... You know, he's not a spring chicken anymore. You know, he's not a youngster anymore. He's all, he's up there. I believe he's in his 40s. So, Brian Kendrick is leaving WWE, maybe to recharge his batteries. We don't know. They granted it to him. He's not a game changer. So, when someone comes to management and says, I am broken down. I cannot give you my absolute best. I need to step away for a little bit and recharge my batteries. He, he's not leaving WWE. He's probably taking what is known as a a sabbatical, and he's gone. He's gone, and then when he's recharged and fully ready to go, maybe he'll be back, and maybe they'll look at him in a different light, and maybe. You know, things will be a little little different when he comes back, but right now, Brian Kendrick, not on 205 Live. He is taking a leave of absence from the WWE. This one is actually very surprising. Oni Lorcan has requested his WWE release. During Wrestling Observer Radio, Meltzer discussed Oni Lorcan. Apparently, he hasn't been happy for a while This could be amplified by the fact that he is relatively young and wants to compete at a high level while he can. He actually changed his name on Twitter back to Biff Busick. That was his independent name coming out of Massachusetts. Meltzer says, and I quote, Oni Lorcan is, I guess, wanting out. I don't know the whole story behind Oni Lorcan. The only thing I've heard is that he's been very unhappy for a while. I know a lot of guys who have been very unhappy for a while. I think he started in 2015, so he's been there for a little over four years. You know, if you got like a year to go, and I know that year is going to be a hell of a long time, and you are in your wrestling prime, it is very fleeting, and Oni Lorcan is almost 34, so it's probably like you're getting to that stage of, man, I know I'm good and I'm never going to get a chance to show it here, but if I wait three years to get out of here, you know, maybe I won't be as good three years from now. Maybe I'll be more banged up. I need to get out of here Maybe that's what's weighing on his head, end quote. Now, if you guys are following Lorcan on Twitter, you know, he changed his name, like I said, back to Biff Busick. He deleted all of his tweets, and the bio of his Pro Wrestling Tees store is now in his Twitter profile. So there you go. Middle finger to WWE. Not like he had merchandise anyway, so why not? He has been signed with the WWE since 2015, hasn't won any championships, 
Although he is challenged for the NXT Tag Team Championships and the Cruiserweight Championships on a number of occasions. He was most be- recently beat on NXT TV by Leo Rush. That got Leo Rush uh, a championship match against Drew Gulak, which he eventually won and became the new Cruiserweight Champion. Oni Larkin is only the latest WWE superstar to come forth and ask for a release. And the last one before that was Sin Cara, and we all know that WWE did not grant Sin Cara, of all people, his release. Now, I'm going to make a guess as to why Oni Larkin is not really satisfied in the WWE. Two reasons. Number one, the guy is fucking fantastic. The guy is excellent. Now, you look at Oni Lorcan and you look at him, and I even said this way back when. I don't I don't know exactly when I said it, but you look at somebody with the name of Biff Busick. He comes on into the WWE, and they change his name to Oni Lorcan. Not really a headline-grabbing name. It's not somebody that you look at. You know, you look at him, and then you see the name that they gave him. It's not a main event level act, just by name alone, you know, it's ridiculous, he got to a point in WWE where he already was given a certain ceiling, and that ceiling was not going to be raised, he was not going to surpass and break through that ceiling, you look at somebody like Biff Busick, Oni Lorcan, and you look at somebody that is... The prototypical guy, the stereotypical guy that they put in the ring with a brand new talent that they're incredibly high on, and they want that new talent to get some rub and work with the grizzled veteran like Oni Lorcan. Oni Lorcan is always that type of guy. He was always looked at as that type of guy that was in the ring to rough somebody up a little bit. You know, he's very good at bringing somebody 10, 12 minutes, 15 minutes in a great match for a debut like Somebody will run through a couple of jobbers, then they give him Oni Lorcan. If you get through Oni Lorcan and work great with Oni Lorcan, then you could move on up the, the ladder in NXT. That's the type of guy that I looked at when I looked at Oni Lorcan. He is excellent. He is way too good for what they're currently giving him right now. And I'm going to look at Oni Lorcan and say, this is just my, my guess on this, that with NXT moving from one hour, where he was not regularly featured, but featured on NXT, where he was featured on the one-hour WWE Network show, now that they moved to the USA Network, and at two hours, there really isn't a place for Oni Lorcan, because WWE is going to need to use all of their star power and start putting those guys that they deem almost ready, or use the guys that they want in that spotlight, in front of the live audience, now that they're going head-to-head with AEW, and ratings matter, and, you know, the, the, the social media talk matters, and the trending on social media matters on Wednesday. And AEW, like I said, I gotta mention it again, matters, they're head-to-head with AEW. You're not gonna put someone like Oni Lorcan in a big spotlighted role. And he wants to break out, he wants to go out there and make a difference, he wants to go out there and change you know, the wrestling landscape. He's not going to be able to do that in WWE. He's not. He's not. And with NXT moving to USA Network in two hours, going head there with AEW, the chances of that significantly decreased. Now he wants out. And I don't blame him. I really don't blame him. There is really no... There's no room for a guy like Oni Lorcan on WWE TV. There's none. There's none. He was never going to make it to the main roster, and if he did, he was not going to be used in a meaningful way. He was going to be a fucking... Look at Drew Gulak now on SmackDown Live. Have we seen anything out of Drew Gulak besides being destroyed by Braun Strowman? They went right back to giving him the PowerPoint presentation because Vince McMahon doesn't know the body of work that Drew Gulak did when he shed that gimmick. Oh, that's the guy with the billboard and the PowerPoint presentation. Let's go back to that. Power slam by Braun Strowman, goodbye. Meanwhile, this guy and his body of work this year was fucking amazing. And the matches that he had with Matt Riddle and Kushida and the Cruiserweight Championship run that he was on. Amazing. And he's on SmackDown Live. Only Lorcan looks at that. You mean to tell me he looks at that and gets excited? That's your future. You're nothing but fucking feed for the main roster. They're never going to use you in a meaningful way. Only Lorcan hit his peak when him and Danny Burch challenged for the NXT Tag Team titles against the Undisputed Era. And that was a fantastic match two years ago. Unbelievable match. That was it. After that, nothing. 205 Live, because 205 needed members of that roster, because 
Raw and SmackDown were pulling guys from 205 Live, Ali, Murphy, Cedric, right? Gulak on. It's a situation where I don't blame him. And Oni Lorcan is hopefully going to be on his way back to the Indies so he can do what he wants. But there's more news about Oni Lorcan. He's furious with Triple H after the comments he made on the recent NXT TakeOver conference call. Triple H recently spoke about stars using social media to request their release, something he isn't best pleased about. Now, in the last week, WWE released Jordan Miles following a racism scandal, and Miles, now back to using Super ACH, is already accepting independent bookings. There hasn't been any news on Lorcan and Mike Kanellis. WWE's not letting him go. Luke Harper, Sin Cara, and... They all did the same thing. They went to social media and tried to use social media as a platform to hopefully get their release and go public with it. Triple H said this, anybody who's out there that is serious about it, that's talking about it on the internet, that ain't the place to do it. We all have cell phones. You meet, you handle your business like a professional. Everybody wants to say professional wrestler. The key word in front of that is professional. That's what we're trying to change about the business is to make people more professional. End quote. Only Lorcan seen this, and he took a huge stance on this Triple H comment. He had a very big issue with this and tweeted in reply to Triple H saying this on the conference call, and I quote, The mature professional thing to say would be no comment and have a private conversation promoter to independent contractor instead of burying talent publicly to the media. That's how I do business. It's all about the game and how you play it. End quote. Clearly, Oni Lorcan is very unhappy, and the backstage morale in WWE is not very high at the moment. And even though it is financially rewarding to go to WWE, we, we could be looking at a, a, a mass exodus of talent that wants out. And I mentioned yesterday, internally, there's been discussions about just letting this talent go because the talent feeling this way is mixing in with the other talent and it's bringing backstage morale down. WWE needs to do something to bring backstage morale up as if WWE is the only place to be and letting these guys go might be the best result for them. But WWE won't do that. When have they ever given a shit about their actual talent and locker room? Never. Oni Lorcan, I feel bad for him. The guy is fucking great and I just want to see him happy. But I can honestly tell you, my guesstimation would be the opportunity when they moved to USA Network dwindled his chances of ever getting a shot in WWE and it's damn near zero at this point. Because WWE's got to do what's best for business. And what's best for business in their eyes is competing with AEW. Oni Lorcan's never going to get an opportunity to do what he thinks he could do in WWE while they're competing with another wrestling promotion head-to-head on Wednesday night. That's just my two cents. Spoilers for Sunday. Survivor Series is Sunday. If you guys don't know, if you guys don't want to hear the spoilers, I will give you about five seconds as I take my drink of water. So I'll start right now. Now, this should come as to no surprise for you guys, but the current Survivor Series card is dominated by multi-person non-title matches between champions of Raw, SmackDown, and NXT, you know, standard elimination matches as well. Now, Rey Mysterio is challenging Brock Lesnar for the WWE title, The Fiend is defending the Universal Championship against Daniel Bryan, and Adam Cole is defending the NXT Championship against either Pete Dunne, Killian Dane, or Damian Priest. I hope it ends up being Pete Dunne because that's the best match for that crowd in Chicago. Now, according to the latest reports from Cage Side Seats, Mysterio, Bryan, and whoever comes out of the Pete Dunne, Killian Dane, and Damian Priest match will all be coming away from Survivor Series empty-handed as no title changes are expected to take place. Now, the report is that the current title feuds are expected to run through at least the Royal Rumble, so get used to seeing Mysterio and Lesnar, get used to seeing Bryan and The Fiend, And whatever happens with Adam Cole, I suspect that we're moving on from whoever he fights at the Survivor Series to Tommaso Ciampa. That's the next in line for the title match in NXT. Brock Lesnar and Wyatt, they are brand new champions. So just based off the fact that they just won the championships, Lesnar won it on that debut episode of SmackDown from Kofi Kingston. Wyatt just won the title a couple weeks back at Crown Jewel. There's no reason... For anybody to believe that they are losing those championships. So, it's not even a spoiler at that point. It's just common sense. Adam Cole, NXT, WWE, Triple H, Shawn Michaels, anybody in charge at NXT is not taking the title off of Adam Cole. That would be a fucking stupid, brain-dead decision. 
So, whatever you see as far as championship matches at Survivor Series, there's no sense in even thinking about a title change. It's not going to happen. WWE debuted a new title on SmackDown with the Intercontinental Championship. Russell Votes actually tweeted out Friday before SmackDown, and they said this, and I quote, Big night for titles. Hearing two redesigns are completely done, and both have a real good shot at debuting on SmackDown. One did. One did. One's a bit more obvious than the other, considering the colors of both shows. Hint, hint. Now, Russell Votes is usually a very good source for rumors and speculation. So we got the Intercontinental Ch uh, Championship title change. I love it. I love it. I think it's a great new design. It's got an NXT feel. I did say on SmackDown's review last night, if you guys missed that, link will be down below in the description, that the prestige of the white title is something that I don't think really needed a change. If they wanted to change the the white strap to the black strap, I think that could have been a new look. It, it could have drastically changed the look of the title to give it a new feel. Maybe update the front plates, you know, give it more of an updated look, but have that old school feel to it. They wanted to get rid of it. So the legacy of that title is gone. And again, my inner conspiracy theorist came out. Cody introduced that title. WWE wanted nothing to do with it anymore. Cody brought it in. Fuck it. They wanted a new title. Now, I don't think the Intercontinental Championship needed a facelift. I didn't think we needed to go out there and get a brand new Intercontinental Championship. But there's one title on anybody that needs a change. The United States Championship, in my eyes, is the one title that looks the most outdated out of everything. That needed the biggest facelift. Now, we got a new IC title. I think it looks beautiful. It finally looks like a championship. And a lot of people don't like it. Felt the need to go out there and say that the, it didn't need to change. I agree with you, but the, 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 the new title looks beautiful. Now, if we start changing the US title and the tag team titles, I, I think we'll be good to go. Because I don't see the WWE changing the main titles. I, I wish that they would. Because they look ridiculous with that big fucking logo front uh, faceplate. I don't like it. But we got the Intercontinental Championship. There was supposed to be two debuting titles. They might have saved one for SmackDown. And the other one could be Bray Wyatt getting his custom belt. I hope so. Because that blue title looks absolutely ridiculous. Just based off the color scheme of Wyatt's act. Blue mixed with what he looks like. Not really a good look. Not really a good look. And I hope. Uh, I hope for the red light to be gone. I don't think that's going to be the case. Because they're fickle fucking people over there. But I hope for the fact that when Bray Wyatt comes out at the Survivor Series. Remember when The Undertaker won his first WWE Championship. And he defeated Hulk Hogan at the Survivor Series. I hope we see the Fiend drag the title with him. Like The Undertaker used to do. The Undertaker, I love when The Undertaker fucking beat Hulk Hogan at the 1991 Survivor Series, and he was the WWE champion. He walked out with Paul Barry. He dragged the fucking title like a corpse, like a fucking dead animal. I love it. I wish The Fiend would do that at the Survivor Series because I can't see The Fiend wearing the title. I can't see The Fiend draping the title over his shoulder. I'd love if he carried the lantern in one hand and dragged the title with the other hand. I think that would be a great visual. So he might be the other one getting a facelift, and we might actually see it saved for the Survivor Series. So we can only hope, but... There is a rumor going around that not one, but two championships have gotten a complete redo. So we'll see what happens at the Survivor Series. It took WWE till this week to realize that they have a big Survivor Series problem. Brian Alvarez on Wrestling Observer Live heard that it actually took WWE a while before someone realized that they booked themselves into a corner. Funny story, he says. When they were putting together all of these matches, it actually took them a while before somebody realized... Wait a second, that's a lot of falls to have in these elimination matches. There's 15 people here. So you have to have between what? 10 and 14 falls. That's what you got. Now, it was, propo it was proposed that WWE could do something to eliminate a bunch of people at once with DQ or countouts. I don't know what they're going to do. It was even raised that it could be an elimination style match between the two you know, elimination matches, start with three, one representative from each brand, if Raw gets eliminated in that match, send out another Raw guy, have it be a round robin elimination type deal, I don't know how they're going to work this, 
I really don't know how... This is going to look ridiculous. And I'm going to laugh on Sunday night when I sit here and do the review that this looks utterly ridiculous. Now, the one thing that I propose, which I honestly think is the best idea out of all, it honestly should have been Raw and SmackDown teaming up against NXT. Now, WWE would have never done that because they feel like they need everybody on the show. And not everybody needs to be on the show. I say it about WrestleMania every year. Not everybody needs to be on WrestleMania. You don't. If you took key members from Raw and SmackDown, and if you wanted to two, if you wanted to do two sets of elimination matches, you could have did that. You could have did two men's matches and one women's match, because the women's roster is much less than the men's. That's you. You could have did that. You could have had fun with the Survivor Series and make it fucking traditional, but WWE doesn't give a shit about what we say. You could have had members from Raw and SmackDown collectively team up, an A squad and then an A squad off the side, you know, or A squad or a B squad going against NXT. Because both, all three shows have more than enough talent to compensate for this. You could do four on four, five on five. It would have been something that looked aesthetically much more pleasing than what we're going to get on Sunday. Raw and SmackDown versus NXT. That would have been the way to go. Standard, four on four or five on five Survivor Series matches and maybe put something on the line. That's the way it should have been done. NXT versus Raw versus SmackDown, five on five on five. And there's going to be three members in the ring all at the same time. It is going to look ridiculous. I don't even know how to begin to plan something like that. They booked themselves into a creative mess on Sunday night. And actually, I hope it fails. Because next year, then they'll think, well, we can't do that again. Because it didn't come off too well in 2019. I hope they know what they're doing. But this is, and I stated this from day one, it's going to be a serious problem. WWE is planning an epic Survivor Series surprise. Now, Triple H confirmed that one spot for Team NXT will be revealed the day of the pay-per-view. Now, Team NXT is probably going to be, for Survivor Series, most of the people comprised in the War Games match. Don't know what it's going to be comprised of. He promised everybody that they will be excited, so that really makes everybody wonder while listening to this conference call. WWE has a few superstars that they could debut at the Survivor Series. Johnny Gargano has reportedly been out. I got news on him in a second. Johnny Gargano's out. Velveteen Dream, they're out of action. Shawn Michaels could come back for the Survivor Series and he could be in the match. It would be a lot easier for him in that type of environment, but I don't want to see Shawn Michaels take a spot from a youngster that could actually benefit from it. But Triple H mentioned that he has no interest himself working in the event and he did promise an epic surprise. I don't know what that means, so we'll see. A lot of people are confirming that, or a lot of people are speculating, I should say, not confirming that, the War Games final member is either going to Johnny Gargano or Johnny Mundo. Johnny Impact. Johnny Wrestling. You know? I don't know if they're going to really... They, they can't really name him Johnny Wrestling because that's Johnny Gargano's nickname. But uh, John Morrison. John Morrison is being heavily rumored as that fourth guy in the War Games match. Don't know if that's going to transfer itself to the Survivor Series, so we'll see. But Triple H has been requested to work this match. Vince wants Triple H to work this match. I don't want to see Triple H work the Survivor Series match. That is completely unnecessary. Why would you take a talent spot away from somebody who could actually benefit from it to put Triple H in there? Yeah, it gives NXT in the eyes of the fucking idiot out there watching, gives NXT the best chance of winning, but it's not something I want to see, you know? So we'll see what happens, but Triple H is... Is getting everybody excited about an epic Survivor Series surprise. Imagine if the epic Survivor Series surprise is Triple H. How let down will you be at the Survivor Series? Now, Triple H, also on the same conference call, he revealed that WWE had considered a match at Survivor Series with all three top champions, Universal Champion, WWE Champion, and NXT Champion. On paper, it sounds epic, but it was eventually nixed WWE's decision was to go with Brock Lesnar and Rey Mysterio and then Daniel Bryan versus The Fiend. So, obviously, we all know why that match could not happen. Cole can't lose. 
Bray Wyatt can't lose and Brock Lesnar can't lose. So you, you talk about WWE booking themselves into a fucking creative corner. That would have been a mess. An absolute mess. We don't want to see Adam Cole take a mandible claw. We don't want to see Bray Wyatt deliver a fucking F5 to, to Adam Cole. We don't want to see Bray Wyatt deliver, or, or the Brock Lesnar rather deliver an F5 to, to Bray Wyatt. It, it's stupid. It's stupid. It creatively doesn't make any sense. All of your champions need to look strong. Somebody in that company has a fucking brain and nicks the match saying, guys, this is not a good idea. Thank God they did. They went in the much better direction, putting Lesnar with Mysterio. I'm still not sold on Wyatt and Bryan at this moment yet until a story fully develops. So we'll see what happens, but they definitely did go in the right direction. The Survivor Series card is as follows to get you guys ready for it. The Fiend versus Daniel Bryan. The Fiend is winning. I'm not even going to go over it. The Fiend is going to go over here. No question about it. Lesnar versus Mysterio. Lesnar is going to come out on top. AJ Styles versus Shinsuke Nakamura versus Roderick Strong. I am actually going with AJ Styles in this match. AJ Styles has looked very weak in the last couple of weeks against Humberto. So I think AJ is going to come out on top and beat Nakamura and Roderick Strong. Shayna Baszler versus Bayley versus Becky Lynch. I think Shayna Baszler taps out Becky Lynch. Oh, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. I think Shayna Baszler taps out Bayley. That's the, the way I'm going with this match. Bayley is there to eat the pin or the submission. Becky doesn't need this. Shayna needs this because she's looked dominant and she's been one of the most dominant, if not the most dominant women's champion in all of the company. Shayna has to win it. Shayna's going to win. She's beaten everybody else. Why should there be any difference if it's Bailey or Becky Lynch? Shayna is a badass. You got to give it to Shayna Baszler. I'm going with Shayna. Viking Raiders versus Big E and Kofi versus Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly. Out of the Survivor Series matches, I'm not going with Roderick. I'm not going with... Uh, and there's that, that really is it. Adam Cole's going to fight either Pete Dunne, Killian Dane or Damian Priest, but I'm going with Bobby Fischer, Kyle O'Reilly to win this match and be crowned as the best tag team in all of WWE. I'm going with them to beat the New Day and the Viking Raiders in the triple threat tag team match. It's probably the one match I'm looking forward to most because, you know, when the New Day is in that type of situation, they always deliver. We all know how good Undisputed Era is. We all know how good the Viking Raiders are. In fact, Bobby Fischer, Kyle O'Reilly versus the Viking or the War Raiders at the time the Viking Raiders in January during TakeOver Phoenix, one of the best, the second best tag team title match of the entire year. The second best tag team match of the entire year, period. So go out and watch what those two teams can do together. There's no reason why the Undisputed Era cannot get their victory back here over the Viking Raiders. I do think that one member of the Undisputed Era does pin one member of the Viking Raiders here in the New Day. They're simply in this match. Replacing the Revival, even though the Revival probably would have been the better match, Vince looks at the New Day and thinks, I cannot have the New Day miss the Survivor Series. That's the only reason why we got them in this match to begin with. Seth Rollins, Ricochet, Drew McIntyre, Kevin Owens and Randy Orton versus Roman Reigns, Mustafa Ali, Braun Strowman, Shorty G, Chad Gable, Baron Corbin, and who's the fifth man? Did they announce who the fifth man was? Oh, uh, yeah, it's uh, Corbin, Gable, Strowman, Ali, Ring. Okay, and then we got NXT, five. We got five on NXT. I'm thinking it's going to be Keith Lee. I'm thinking it's going to be Matt Riddle. I'm thinking it's going to be Dominic Dijakovic. I'm thinking it's going to be Tommaso Ciampa. You know, you could probably put Finn Balor in there for Dominic Dijakovic, right? If they want to put Balor into the NXT mix. The fifth guy, I don't really know. I don't want it to be Triple H. Can't be Johnny Gargano. Johnny Gargano is actually out. Triple H gave an update on him. It's day-to-day, but hopefully it won't be too, too long. So that is where Johnny Gargano is right now. There's a moment in time where things happen, people get frustrated, and... Well, actually, I'm sorry. Um, He also addressed the unhappiness in the company. I'll get into that in a second. But it's day-to-day with Johnny Gargano, and this would have been an epic match and a big moment with... Balor and Gargano, but it is what it is, and he's sort of day-to-day right now, and is kind of going day-to-day on how he feels. There's nothing that there is like it is right now where it's structurally concerning or anything like that. It's just a management of symptoms, and we're trying to get him past all of that, so that really is the update. It's just day-to-day with Johnny Gargano. It was supposed to be him and Balor, and not Riddle and Balor. So Johnny Gargano, it could be 
The fact that Johnny Gargano shows up, I don't want it to be because that's not, 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 not really going to be a big surprise at all. I would actually want it to be Johnny Mundo. I would want it to be John Morrison. So if that's the case, I think that would be great. And him mixing it up in there with Style, uh, not Styles, uh, with Rollins. Uh, him mixing it up in, in that match with Ricochet and McIntyre and Ali. I think that would be a good look. So we'll see what happens. I'm going I'm going with Team NXT being Champa, Lee, Riddle, Balor, and John Morrison. That's what I'm going with. So we'll see what happens. The women's elimination match we seen on SmackDown last night. It was Team NXT that was just unceremoniously announced. I figured that the winner of the women's War Games match would actually be the team to go challenge Raw and SmackDown at Survivor Series. But we got Rhea Ripley, we got Tegan Knox, we got Mia Yim, Candice LeRae, and then unceremoniously we got Tony Storm involved in this thing, which I didn't like because you know she's supposed to be a future of this women's division. And you just throw her out there as if she's just another typical blonde. So it's it's a very unceremonious debut for Tony Storm. We got Sasha Banks, Dana Brooke, Carmella, Lacey Evans, and Nikki Cross on SmackDown. And then we got Charlotte Flair, Asuka, Kyrie Sane. We got Sarah Logan and Natalia on Monday Night Raw. I, I love to see the interactions between Sasha and Rhea Ripley again. I love to see Sasha and Tony Storm go at it. I love to see Candice LeRae and Charlotte Flair go at it. You know, I'd love to see Tony Storm and Natalia go at it. It's got a lot of good matchups involved in this thing. But before you know it, Lacey Evans is probably going to end up pinning Tony Storm in about 15 seconds. And then I'm going to come on here and rant. What type of debut was that for Tony Storm, who just won your Mae Young Classic last time, for the main roster? Can't have that happen. I am going with Team Raw. I'm going with Team Raw in the men's match. And I'm going with Team SmackDown. On the women's match. I do not think NXT is winning any of those matches against the main roster. I don't. I only think Adam Cole is retaining the title. And I think Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly are going to win their three-way. And that's the extent of what WWE is going to do. As far as NXT's involvement in the Survivor Series. Yet we all know why they're involved. They're, they're only involved in the Survivor Series because of the AEW effect. And I went over this on Wednesday. If you guys wanted to go watch my NXT Review, or on Thursday, rather. Go and watch that review. The first 30 minutes is all you need to know about why NXT is in its current state right now on Wednesday night. But I do not think NXT is coming out of this. They'll look strong, but there's no way Vince is going to put NXT over any of his main roster guys at all. So that's the Survivor Series. I do have an up. I do have a card for NXT TakeOver. We might as well go over because it's going to be happening in a couple hours. I'm going with Finn Balor to beat Matt Riddle. I'm going with Team Champa over the Undisputed Era in War Games. I'm going with Team Shayna in War Games. I think the heels are going to win at their War Games match. The women, they're going to win in their War Games match. I think Pete Dunne is going to beat Killian Dane and Damian Priest. And I think he's going to get the NXT Championship match at Survivor Series. And if they add a fifth match, which I don't think that they have yet... I would add Leo Rush versus Angel Garza for the Cruiserweight Championship. That's what I would do. And I would give that title win to Angel Garza and have him be the new Cruiserweight Champion. I hope. I think those guys deserve it. And I said this for the last couple of weeks. That would be a great match in Chicago at TakeOver. So that is it, guys. That is all I got for Off the Script today. A couple hours before TakeOver War Games. I'll be right back here later after the show is over to talk about War Games and everything that happened in the show. Full, detailed review. Make sure you guys check that out. And I hope you guys enjoyed everything that was in this video. Let me know what you guys think. Getting a little uh, tired there at the end because I've done so much as far as content goes in the last couple days. I'm drained. Gotta rest myself up for war games. But thank you guys so very much for all of your support here on the podcast. Episode 301 is in the books. I'll be back here next week with episode 302. Obviously, I'll be back tonight with TakeOver. I'll be back tomorrow night with Survivor Series. Big weekend ahead of us. Again, leave a comment down below. Let me, let me know what you guys think of all the big stories in this video. Hit that thumbs up. Follow me on social media at JD from NY206. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on that bell for all notifications. Check out Harry's, harrys.com slash script. Make sure you guys get your Ridge wallets today before Christmas. That's ridge.com slash script. Use code script at checkout for 10% off. And check out all the other videos that you might have missed this week on the channel down below. Guys, thank you so much. Hit that thumbs up, and I will see you right back here tonight for TakeOver War Games. Until then, enjoy your Saturdays, and I'll see you later 
after takeoff. See you guys then.